this potential that we have. Now I get it. We all get older and everything like that, but we give it away. Mm. Being physical is a gift. It's a gift. Being, being able to learn is a gift. Being able to connect to the creator of the universe is a gift. And we give it away. We give it away. So, so there, the only way, the only way we as human beings get better at anything, and if we have strength conditioning coaches listening, I know we do, we know full well the only way we can get better at anything is we got to get stressed. It's the only way. You got to get out of your homeostatic state. You've got to be uncomfortable. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast. Here we are all about performance coaching with eternal purpose. And on today's show, we have Mike Sanders. Mike is the Human Performance and Wellness Coordinator for 7th Special Forces Group, and he is the author of the new book, Seek, Adapt, Endure, Following the Way of the World's Most Authentic Man. I personally got, I just finished reading the book, and I have read many books. This is one of my favorite. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, already things I know about you are that you're interested in human performance, and you're interested in integrating the spiritual piece to it. And, and this book is just that. Mike dives deep into so many awesome topics that we see all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and he combines them so well to drive home his points that'll help you as a coach uh, and as a person. And so uh, I'm really excited to talk to him about that today. Regardless of the book, guys, I've wanted to get Mike on the show for a long time now, and this just seemed to be the perfect way to do it. And so uh, he's a wealth of knowledge, and he, I think you guys will really enjoy hearing from him. So, Mike, thank you for, for coming on today. Absolutely. I'm super, super excited to be here. Uh, you guys are talking about your, your podcast talks about two of my favorite things, uh, human performance and God. So let's do this. I'm ready. Let's do it. Awesome. Uh, well, right off the bat, I just want to pull from something that you wrote on page 15 in the book, Mike, and then just turn it over to you. It's, it's something that stood out to me. And, and it says, our creator made us both male and female look like him and represent his character and nature on the earth. This means we are most ourselves when we are most like him. Whenever we fail to imitate him is where we fail to be men. This truth is the cornerstone of our identity. I love that. Um, what are your thoughts on optimal human performance and how we were designed to live as tripartite beings? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, first of all, to, to dip into that tripartite piece, uh, I studied long and hard about this, and I read a lot of different authors about kind of what 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 makes up the human domain and uh, domains and who who we are. Um, and so, uh, mind, body, spirit, soul, spirit, bo uh, body, uh, those are all different things that you know the Bible talks about. There's theologians that talk about it, and so forth. And quite honestly, I don't think anybody clearly knows and and can really separate or delineate uh, to draw a, a clear demarcation line of of um you know the difference between spirit soul uh, uh body mind and all those different things um and so uh but i i do lean into the concept you know uh, uh of us being tripartite which is to say that we are soul uh uh spirit and 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 uh body with that being said then um i do believe uh that when we are as human performance people and one of the mistakes i used to make is I used to think everything was built off of physiology, and I, and I, I know that's not true, uh, because if we're only looking at someone from a physiological standpoint, we're missing those other two dona domains, uh, and and so we have to look at that in, the, in that respect and to understand that the human is much more than what we see in, in the mirror. Right. And, um, and and we have to engage in that process. And, and, and what I mean by engaging that process is how do we bring out the highest amount of potential um, of those of the of the tripartite human being as opposed to just the physiological side of things. And I think that is something that we need to understand completely. Um, with that being said, then uh, that that, you know, there's Bible passages that talk about how, uh, you know, in, in, in Thessalonians, for example, where 
uh, that God cuts to the very marrow, uh, to the very to the very depths of, of our soul and, and everything. And so that, he, you know, he's able to get into the very just the, the deepest parts of our being. Um, and and uh, those pieces then cannot be separated. They are mm. when, we, when we're t- when when uh, we are whole only when all of those pieces are together. And so uh, I, I think I quote, I know I quote uh, 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 Pastor Eberly uh, in the book. And one of the things that he said is what the spirit has, the soul has, what the body has, the spirit has and so forth. And so to take that even further, what the mind has is what the soul has. And so all of their, they're interdependent. They cannot be separated. Um, and, and therefore, when we engage with people, we have to keep that in the back of our mind because that that's who we are, right? I am that and so are you. And so I have, need to engage that. The next thing you're, you're asking, uh, it, you talked about finding our identity. Um, I think that's what you asked. Uh, yep, yep, <laughs> uh, yep. Okay, great. Keep um, it rolling, yeah. Yeah, and so so the the Hebrew word for man is Adam, and so you have you have in in the book uh, the, the Bible uh, you have this story of all these Adams, and 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 when I say man, I'm also talking about woman as well. You have all uh, the story of all these Adams. Well, we we start the process off with the first Adam, and it ends with the last Adam. First Adam being Adam, uh, and then you have the last Adam being being Jesus. So, so I truly believe, there's no doubt in my mind, that the only way that we can find our true identity and know who, exactly who we are is we can only find it through Him. Um, this is not in the book, but this is something I've been researching uh, since. There's a, the, the Paul talks about, I think it's in Romans, talks about a word uh, called daikaiasune, daikaiasune. And daikaiasune, what it means is it means righteousness, or I love this, it means state of him as he ought to be. State of him as he ought to be. So that means then, and when he's, when he's talking about that, he's talking about how Christ has set us free as new men. And, and that's not, that's like, that's some deep metaphysical stuff that we don't necessarily understand completely, but that means that when we have faith in him, we find our identity in him, we find that that's what a human's supposed to be. He is more human than I am. Now, I'm not saying that he's not God. I didn't say that. And I'm not saying that I'm God. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is then that if I can be more like him transformed into a real human the way a human ought to be now i'm suddenly look at sin completely different see sin actually keeps me away from being the true man that i'm was actually meant to be and the more than that i can transform my heart and allow him to transform my heart the more i become the way i was supposed to be the, the way that man ought to be you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. Okay, that was a tough one, but yes. No, that was <laughs> phenomenal, and it's great. And and just how you brought the Greek in there and talking about righteousness, and we understand that our righteousness is not our own. Our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. You know, when they say the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, well, a righteous man has to be a man in Christ because he is our righteousness. And so for you for you to call him the last Adam and talking about how he is righteousness, it's just so beautiful to just see how the Greek combines and stories from the Old Testament, Jesus yes. in the New Testament. The, and the way you did that in the book, it's just every chapter. I love how you pull a different story and combine these things so we can see the the Old Testament revealed in the New Testament. Yeah, and, and I want to go back to that really quick. I just yeah. want to say one more thing here about this is that one of the things as, I, as I'm, I'm learning more and, and, and thinking and, and God's working on my heart, I think about how we as Christians almost get too, too caught up in the crucifixion mm. when really we should be caught up in the fact that Jesus resurrected. Amen. Yeah. Right. Because that means then that he took our unrighteousness to the grave and left it there and left it there and then came out as a new, you know, as, as, as to allow us to be new creations to, again, have the ability then 
to uh, uh, become um, more like him, which is a lifelong sanctification process. And that means then that, that I, I can co-labor with him. I can engage him here in the process of becoming more like him. So in other words, I don't need to hide anything from him. And I shouldn't. Because if I'm honest, which I should be able to be honest with the God of that, that, that died and, and rose for me, then I should be able to be honest and say, you know what, God, I've, Jesus, I've got this issue with lust in my life, or I've got whatever it is in my life, and I need to bring it to you, and I need you to find to show me where that wound is. Why am I like this? And let's work on this together, as opposed to I'm going to hide it from you and try to figure it out on my own. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of goodness there. And so let's go back then to the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, the thing that, that uh, another thing is not in this book, but it's some, gonna there's some some new things I've I've been uh, learning is that the Old Testament. Uh, I think it, don't quote me on this either. Hebrews or the Greeks they had they had a um, a word that they used uh, it was typology. It was a concept of typology. And typology was like, if there's a story or if there's, um, you know, a story that I'm trying to tell or there's poetry or, or, or whatever it is, or I'm even using history at, 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 at some level to tell a story of something that happened in history. Um, what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a type and shadow of something else. It's a type and shadow of something else. So typology then, and, in, and when I say a type and shadow of something else, that would be the anti-type. And the anti-type then is what our New Testament is. So the Old Testament, all the stories, everything in there is pointing to, they are types and shadows of something, which is an anti-type. And the anti-type being, anti being something better. Yes. Much, much better. So when we look at the Old Testament, which is based off of Old Covenant, and for all those of listening if you don't understand covenant theology start learning about it because it will change everything when you read the bible um the old testament then is types and shadows of of jesus of a new heaven and a new earth and a new man a new adam those are all types of an anti-type of where we're headed and and that's and so so we should not ignore the old testament because the Old Testament is showing us the, 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 the lead up to its history. It's history. It's where man began and where man is ultimately going to end. And we can all learn from it. And so anyway. Amen. Amen. I, honestly, we, we have a list of questions here. I could just stay on the first one and we can take that in so many directions <laughs> oh, for an hour. I know. So, and we can do that too if you want to. It's up to you. you just, oh, man. Just it's so good. Do. It's so good. Um. Uh, we'll, we'll go to go. We'll go to the next one here because I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this. So this is something that I originally started thinking on when I read John Eldridge's book Wild at Heart, and I know you mentioned that one in your book as well. Yep. Um, what a great book just to talk about true yep. masculinity. Oh, it's 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 phenomenal. And this is when I started thinking about it. And so I do think it's true that the stigma amongst Christian men is that they're supposed to fit in a certain box. And that box that society has created for them is, you know, um, just mild mannered, meek and quiet and submissive. And, and that bothered me because as a Christian, as a man, I was like, man, I feel like there's another side of me that really wants to come out. And I just don't associate well with that kind of stigma. And so you addressed it so well in your book. And I just wanted to, to talk to you about for all our men that are listening you know, how would you define true masculinity um, according to your understanding of scripture? Okay, that's, I love this. So um, the thing that, that God tells us is, uh, or the Bible uh, talks about is God is love. And, and so we have to stop and think about that for a second. And, and then we, the next thing is, is it, and I'm getting to the point now where I don't even like talking, uh, separating Jesus and the Father. I get, I get where the, I get the concept. But at the end of the day, it can get confusing. And the reality is Jesus is, is God. And that's so in other words, he's the exact representation of 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 God, the father and, and the creator and, and everything like that. And so with that being said, then what's interesting is, is that, you know, Paul talks a lot in the New Testament, again, about um, the love of God. 
Well, uh, one, the, the main lo- uh, sort of love that he's talking about is agape love. Agape mm-hmm. love then means that uh, the, um, the giver of that love, you being the receiver, me giving that love, you, my, what my intention here is, is I only want the best possible whatever it is for you. So in other words, I want, and, and I look at this in, in tying back to some of the things we were talking about, about the state of, uh, of him who, as he ought to be and so forth with uh, earlier on in the interview. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that means then that, that it's interesting though, and maybe I'm reading into this as a human performance guy, right? But it mm-hmm. seems to me that Jesus actually wants us to be at our highest potential, mind, body, and spirit. Mm-hmm. Like, we want for our athletes and, and, our, and our warriors that we train and, and everything like that. And so, so agape love then is, is, is the driving fuel. It's the fire behind Jesus Christ. So again, we have him being uh, the last Adam. And again, the more we're like him, the more we are whole and robust and uh, we are who we're supposed to be. Well, you were just, you referenced John Eldridge a minute ago. He actually has another book called Beautiful Outlaw. And I don't know if you've read that one. No, I haven't. It's, it's, it might be one of my favorite books of all time. I don't, it's oh, hard wow. It, it is, it's unbelievable. And whenever I'm feeling um, disconnected from, from Jesus, I'll pick that book up and it brings me right back. Well, one of the things that he talks about a lot in there is he talks about the very, he talks about the character and he goes right to the Bible to talk about, hey, these are things that happen. And, and uh, for example, flipping over tables, I was pretty angry, <laughs> right? He was, he was pretty upset there. There was, and, and somebody would say, well, that's pretty violent, especially in society today. Oh my gosh, you know, any sort of aggressiveness whatsoever. Uh, and, and, but he, it, but it, also he was fierce, fierce intentionality. That's, that was uh, something that Eldridge actually, so I'm quoting him. He was a, had a fierce intentionality. He was being chased by, you know, people were trying to kill him all the time. He was argumentative. He was intellectual. He was conversational. He could, he could actually, he was ethical. He could actually have conversation and debate and wasn't scared of those things. And he wasn't scared to call people out. But the key to this and go back to the agape, agape love. And I love what Eldridge says is he says, and don't forget, everything was based on love. <laughs> right? So, so in other words, in the church today, I'll go ahead and say it. I feel like we're taking masculinity away from men. And no wonder men don't want to go to church. Mm. Mm-hmm. But because we're being told, hey, you got to be a nice boy. You got to be a this, you got to be that. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't. There's no reason for me. There's not. I need to be fierce and intentional. I need to, I, I need to be, I need to, if I see something happening, and in in, in 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 the street, and 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 someone's getting hurt. Now it's not a good time to turn the other cheek. Mm-hmm. It's time to go and do what you're supposed to do, which is to be an aggressive male. Yes. So in in, in so anyway, uh, there you go. So that that's that's the idea is that uh, that 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 we that the church has done a very 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 I think they've done a disservice to men uh, in taking away. The reality of the way God created us is we're we're aggressive we're aggressive people and I'm not saying that we're we should go out gun toting and you know smoking everybody in the face and everything like that and that's what I'm saying but I am saying that if we understand agape love then all of a sudden the decisions we make and uh and if we tie that to our values all of a sudden you know I can start hey, listen you are doing this wrong you, you are making a mistake and you can go to your friend and say you are making a mistake that is wrong. Mm-hmm. Jesus went straight at the Pharisees, man. And he called them names, you know? So anyway, that's, that's my, I love it. That. I love it. Um, well, Hey Mike, I want to shift a little bit towards leadership. Now I know you're, you're the head of your department and I wanted to get your wisdom on this. Um, as a lead, as a leader of your department, what are some strategies that you implement um, to bring out the best in your people uh, and the best in the department? Yeah. My, the one thing that uh, that we discuss quite a bit here is the one of the first things I like to let let our people know uh, on where I stand personally is I do not believe in any I don't believe in failure. 
Um, and in fact, I even tell them, listen, if we're not failing every once in a while, as long as no one's getting killed, <laughs> we're not doing any, anything unethical, um, it, you know, is, or getting, anybody's getting hurt. If we're, if we're not failing every once in a while, then we're not trying hard enough. Mm -hmm. So, and I tell my kids the same thing. So failure, failure is, it's like this, you know, I actually learned this from the, from the weight room back in, back in the collegiate days, you know, on test day, uh, at some point when you're rep maxing on a squat, guess what? You're going to fail at some point, at some point. But that's not that doesn't mean you're a failure. Now we know this is where you're you're at, and now we know what we got to do in order to get you to the next next ridge line or to the next max, whatever it might be. So so failure, um, and when you're scared of failure, you're not going to innovate. You're not going to create. So sometimes you have to just go. You know what? I'm going to try this. And again, as long as no one's getting hurt, we're not doing something unethical. Let's let's go ahead. And if it fails, okay. Now we know that didn't work. Let's do it a different way. That's, that's the first one. And then the second one is, is that this is probably going to tie into some of the, some of the other answers that you, uh, that I have for some of the questions later on, but that's okay. We'll figure that out when we get there. But um, I also think that, uh, that we, we need to understand whether you're a, a psychologist, a strength conditioning coach, a physical therapist, an ATC, whatever it is, that is only a tool that you are using to express agape love towards another human being. So, so that anything that we're, anything that we bring to the table as a talent, um, uh, you know, education or, or, or whatever, a coaching style, whatever it is, it, it has to reflect that piece. And when we're doing that, then, then we are bringing the best out of another individual. And then the last one I would say is, is this, is that, I believe, and I talk about this in the leadership uh, chapter, I believe, and I stole this from John Maxwell. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm, uh, you know, giving people the proper uh, <laughs> credit where credit is due. Yeah. yeah proper yeah. credit. So um, <laughs> I also believe in, in uh, 360 degree leadership. And so I always tell my staff, look, just because I'm, they're paying me as, as a guy that's supposed to be the coordinator, uh, whatever of the program does not mean that I, don't believe that you should lead me. So I believe in 360 degree leadership, which is to say there's times when we should lead up. There's a time when we lead across and there's a time when we lead down. And so I think about that in myself. Like if there's, there's somebody, you know, uh, at a higher command, uh, a Colonel, a general, there's times when I can lead up, but in, he's also going to be leading down. Right. Uh, it, it, as, as well. And there's also times when we lead across. And so I think it's very important that, um, there's no doubt in my mind that a good leader listens to the Nikes on the ground, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just using the sport analogy, but we listen to the, to the people that are actually doing the work. And so if you have a strength coach that's out there on, you know, you ask them, Hey, if we, in, if we do this, is this going to work? What do you think? And I think it's very important to, to do those kinds of things. I love it. Hey, here's a quote from the book. I'm going to throw this one at you and get your thoughts. Each of us has great potential for growth, and the degree to which we capitalize on that growth depends upon the mindset we bring to the training ground. I remember one time I, I shot you a text, and I just I was just wondering. I said, "Hey, what does your morning routine look like?" And what yeah. you threw and what you threw back at me, I still tell that to guys. Like in Bible studies, I'm like, "All right, you guys got to hear this routine." Um, so <laughs> I'd love to just hear, you know, what's what is your morning routine like? I think that that's something that a lot of leaders have in common. They're very disciplined and regimented with their time. Um, yeah. And are there any daily disciplines that you have as well? Yeah. So um, I believe in growing uh, mentally every day. I, grew, I believe in growing spiritually every day, and I believe in growing uh, physically every day. So there's your tripartite uh, uh, concept. Um, and, and so I, and when I say every day, I mean every day. It's something that I think is, that, that we need to do. Uh, and so I think that um, it may sound a little bit selfish, but I don't think it is. I think uh, that I need to do that for myself first mm -hmm. so, so that I can get the right mindset and the right uh, approach to what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. So then I can go out and then, um, make my, uh, you know, my workplace better, my family better, my society, my community, make it better. 
And, uh, but I, but I have to work on that transformational part uh, of myself first, so I can bring that transformed self to the table. And so the more that I can um, get heaven's principles and values and, and things in me, the better I can then get them out of me so I can change the environment around me. And, and that's, that's the important piece. So my morning routine might sound a little bit crazy. I don't recommend this for everyone, um, but it just works for me. And I've actually tried it different ways uh, because I, there are times when I'm getting up at, you know, it's super early in the morning. I'm walking around. Why do I do this? But every time I don't do it, I'm not me. So I have to, I have to do it. So I get up at four o'clock in the morning um, and uh, I get out, I roll myself out of bed and I usually read, uh, depends, depending on how much time I have, but I usually read uh, uh, about three, three different books um, uh, from, uh, and, and it's usually about 20 minutes at a shot. So that's about an hour. And then I write for an hour. And I think the, the importance of writing is it allows, uh, okay, first of all, when I read and I read more than one book at a time, uh, this is just how my mind works. Uh, I'm able to make connections between different things that, you know, um, you, you would never ever, and I, you might see that in the book a little bit of time, when I, the book I wrote, uh, I'm able to make these weird connections between different things and, and, and put them together. And so it helps me think that way. And then writing is a way for me to take these concepts that, and, 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 and really be able to like dig into them and then teach myself really to mm. be able to, man, this, you know, because when I, when I write, it, it allows me to, to put some uh, organization to all these things that are kind of going through my head. And so that's when they, that's when the things that I've read, I may not remember, remember every detail, but now they're mine because what I've done, I've taken different pieces and I put them together and I'm like, okay, now, now that's something I'm never probably ever going to forget. And, and, and I incorporate that. And then, so I do that. And then the last thing I do is uh, I write into my workout every day, a 25 minute prayer walk where I'm, I, I'm out praying and I'm, I'm, you know, whatever I got going on, uh, struggles I'm having, challenges I'm, I'm, you know, struggling with. I might have a big meeting coming up. I think I prayed about this one today. Um, uh, you know, and, and so I'm always thinking about that kind of stuff. And then I go smoke myself in, uh, you know, by running, sprinting, hitting a heavy bag, lifting weights, whatever it might be. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hitting all areas of, of my, my tripartite nature. Then go to work, knock out that, and then come home and be a dad. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love it. I love it. I, I wanted more people to hear that because it's inspiring. You know, it, it's, it's something where I think you can always make an excuse or something can always come up, but I agree when I'm not prioritizing my routines and my disciplines that keep me grounded. Yeah. I'm not going to be my best version of myself. And yeah. so I think that strategy that works for you, it might be slightly different for somebody else, but I think what you're saying there, I mean, someone might not have two hours in the morning to, to read and write, but if they have a routine, something that yes. grounds them, yeah. it's, it's huge, you know, yeah. but, um, but I need to start cranking up my, my time reading because I'm not even coming close to tw to uh, two hours there of reading and writing. So. Yeah, and, and I will say that, you know, reading is, I, I say it all the time. I tell my kids, it's one of the most important things I do. It's yes. Just, and if I could say, tell you a really quick story, I'm sorry. Please. I'm hijacking you here, but. I love it. I love it. So a couple of years ago, uh, so my daughter, she plays uh, pretty competitive uh, travel volleyball. And uh, we were in Atlanta and uh, we were sitting there and uh, we, and I just want to point out that I'm, I'm 52 years old. So I've been a strength coach. I've been in human performance for 22 some years or something like that. And so um, I'm an old guy. And uh, as I joke around, there once was a day when I used to go to the gym to, to get my gains. And now I go to the gym to hold on to those gains for as long as I possibly can because they're going away. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, I was watching my kid play. And um, it's just awesome to sit out there and watch her do this, right? And she's been out there. I don't know how many games in we are. It's probably, and I think we're on game, day three of this. And, you know, they're high intensity. They're, it's travel ball. So the, the, the competitive level is higher. You got kids bouncing off the, off the floor and getting back up and running. She's bruised up, you know, tired and everything else. And I was sitting there watching this. And I just had this thought. And I, I do feel like it was a Holy Spirit moment where I was sitting there and I, and, uh, this may come out as arrogant. It, it wasn't meant to be. Um, and I was sitting there thinking, I was like, man, 
I can move pretty good still for, for being 52. Uh, and I can do a lot of good things, but I can't do that, which she's mm -hmm. doing. Right. And, uh, and then I said to myself, and then th that's when, the, when God got a hold of me and, and I just realized these, these, this potential that we have now, I get it. We all get older and everything like that, but we give it away. Mm. Being physical is a gift. It's a gift. Being, being able to learn is a gift. Being able to connect to the creator of the universe is a gift. And we give it away. We give it away. So, so there, the only way, the only way we as human beings get better at anything, and if we have strength conditioning coaches listening, I know we do, we know full well the only way we can get better at anything is we got to get stressed. It's the only way. You got to get out of your homeostatic state. You've got to be uncomfortable. And sometimes that means I got to pick up a book that looks really, really intimidating. And I may not figure the whole thing out right now, but if I continue to learn, because see, knowledge ends up becoming uh, interest in the bank. It's money in the bank. It's there and it gains interest over time because you continue to build on it and build on it and build on it. But we have to take the time to do those things. And when you don't, man, it's just, it's terrible because you're going to sit back one day and go, man, I would just wasted all that time. And so anyway, I just want to point that out. Cause no, I, I love that story, important. Mike. I love yeah. that story. It reminds me, there's a book I read a while back. It's called Play the Man by Mark Batterson. You would love it. And um, it talks in the book about how um, every book that someone writes, usually it takes about two years of life experience to get that thing on the shelf. And if you think about it that way, if you were to ask somebody, how old are they? And they said, you said you're 52 years old. Well, if you're reading X amount of books per year, you might be 500 years old in book knowledge, you know, you can just, uh, it's just, like you said, it's compounding interest. It's exponential yep. growth. I mean, yep. the, as fast as you can read, you can get better. Yep. That's right. Um, yeah, exactly. Totally agree. So I, I love that. And, and I almost feel silly asking you this next question because I already know the answer, but I mean, wh why'd you write the book? Uh, I don't know if I've ever told you the whole story. I'll, okay. I, I want to hear it. Okay. I'll, I'll tell it. I'll, I'll give it to you short. Let's be honest. Do I do anything that's? <laughs> but anyway, no, um, we love it though. Yeah. So uh, uh, when I when I was growing up, um, uh, I, I I was led to believe that there was no chance for me to make it. Um, there was I, I wasn't I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't athletic enough. I wasn't uh, driven enough. None of those things. And so uh, those were the message I was sent. Uh, sent and and. Um, I even had teachers that, you know, wouldn't pay attention to me because what, what I would pay attention to that kid, he's, he's not going to amount to anything anyway. Uh, and one of the things I've always had in my heart, which has caused me issues, but it's also pulled me out of the fire plenty of times is I'm a fighter. So, um, and I usually fight the best when I get my, my back pushed up against the wall. Right. And so there was a time when I graduated from school, high school that uh, I didn't know what I want to do with my life because I had no direction. No one was talking to me about Hey, what are you going to go? What are you going to do? What are you interested in? And so forth. And so um, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And, and thank goodness, uh, I decided to fight back. Um, and what ended up causing me to fight back is I had a construction job. And I was like, my, I'm not doing this the rest of my life. I'm going to, not that there's anything wrong with doing that. It just wasn't for me. And I couldn't do it. And I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to help people. And so I went to school and I, again, uh, didn't really understand it. And this is what's amazing about God too. Like, when you have that relationship with him, you might be doing something and you have no clue why you're doing it. You're just doing it. And, uh, and so I went to college and I'm like, yeah, cool. Strength conditioning. Well, I never even, I never played sport. I never even lifted weights in school. Uh, I, I actually had some health issues back then. And so I, none of this was even on, on my radar. And so I went to college, uh, and I was going to be a strength conditioning coach, whatever that is, and, uh, got into it. And then, but really the reason why is because I am fascinated by human beings um, and, and, and I'm fascinated because I want to know what we're capable of doing. And we're only scratching the surface. I don't think we're ever going to know what we're capable of doing. And so I wanted to know what that was. Well, I, it's not that I was a huge sport fan. It was that the fact that the only way that I can actually scratch that itch 
is this physiologic physiology thing. Well, there's athletes over here. They want to be, be at their highest possible uh, potential. Let's go over there and see how to, how to help them. And so that's why I ended up going to athletics. But I always believed, I always had this belief, as long as we plug in the right science, as long as I work harder than everybody else and I got my team working harder than everybody else, we're always going to be successful. And the world showed me that that worked two national championships and division one hockey um, as, as a strength conditioning coach. And I'm like, yep, yeah, see, all we got to do is we got to plug in the right science and, and so forth and, and work hard and we're always going to be successful. Well, fast forward, I ended up going and working for a SEAL team up in uh, Virginia Beach. When I was there, uh, I took the same concept there too. It was like, all we got to do is plug in the right physiology, the right science. And we're always, these guys are always going to win. They're going to be great. And was able to be part of some uh, amazing, amazing quote unquote world championships uh, there uh, when I was there. And so again, hey, see, I got this thing worked out. I'm doing great and so forth. And then after that happened, two months later, uh, we find out that uh, a whole troop of guys that I had been working with, not most of them I had been working with, were going in on, uh, on an operation. And as we all know, as strength coaches, our goal is to put people into an environment. We want them to walk, go in there and move effectively, efficiently, and safely inside that environment. Why? To win mission or to win championships or to complete the mission and come home. And we want to give them every tool we can in order to help them do that. Well, these guys got on a helicopter and they got blown out of the sky. They didn't even get a chance to fight back. And so when I found out about this, man, I'm telling you, it just absolutely crushed me. Now, God did not crush me. What God did is he met me in that. And I will tell you the best way I can explain it to you is I felt like I got stripped down. First of all, I felt terrible uh, for the guys. I knew, I knew some of their wives. I knew the guys. I knew... I, I can't stop thinking about their kids and I'm just, it's just awful. But then I started, I felt like I had been stripped down and shown the mirror. And, and what I mean by that is, is everything that I thought that made me who I was and made me worthy and actually gave me identity, which I'm a strength and conditioning coach. Therefore I am, you know, it was all taken away and I was shown the mirror and said, Hey, that's, that wasn't enough. That's how I was looking at it. That wasn't enough. And that began this process of going, Mike, do you even know who you are? And the answer was no, I don't know who I am. And so one day I wrote down, who am I? <laughs> I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a, a son. I'm, I'm a son of, of, of God. I'm a son of, of, of an earthly father. I'm, I'm a and mother, I'm a, a brother, I'm a friend, I'm a this, I'm a that. I started, and, and then all of these things started like adding up. And I'm like, well, those are missions. Those aren't purposes. Those are missions. In other words, I have a whole lot of missions, but there's a higher purpose. And that mm -hmm. higher purpose then is got to be the same purposes that God had again. And though Jesus shows us what those look like, right? So that's getting into some other things we can talk about. But my point is, is that all of a sudden I got angry and interestingly enough, the, 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 the first chapter, when I actually sat down, it got cut. We took it out because I was so mad. I was mad at, at myself and I was mad at a lot of men because we're just not doing what we're supposed to, what we've been called to do. And so anyway, um, as I sat down then, I, I always like to have, again, you know, this is my craziness that I, that I get into. I always got to have something to follow. And I was like, all right, well, let's write out some characteristics, some archetypes. What, what makes you want, what are some things that you want to be like? And I started writing them down and I'm like, okay. And it, cause it started out, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking so much about Jesus at the, at the time. So I wrote these all down and I was like, all right, well, who's the authoritative, who's the author, authoritative uh, person on being a warrior? <laughs> uh, who's the scholar? Well, I like Ben Franklin. That guy's pretty cool, but that guy had issues. So I couldn't find any. And I'm like, there's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. So that's how this all kind of came about. That is an incredible story. Thanks for sharing it. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, so here, here, here's a quote from Augustine. I want to get your thoughts on this. 
you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And it's almost like what you were just explaining how it's like, well, who am I? And and the world's going to try and tell us all different explanations of how we can answer that question. And 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 I'm sure we think similarly on this one. There's really only one correct answer to that and only one answer that will give you real peace. Um, you know, you mentioned the back-to-back national championships at Denver, and I've heard you speak before on how you were standing in the middle of the ice when everyone cleared out, looking at the janitors around, cleaning things up, and you just felt like it's like, who am I to be here? And um, yeah. and how it had a certain feeling that maybe wasn't exactly what you thought it would feel like after winning national championships. It wasn't everything that that most people think that it would be cracked up to be. And, um, you know, I think that when we think about like our purpose, um, how does a relationship with Christ and the cultural mandate bring purpose to what we're doing every day, whether you're a strength coach or whether maybe they give this to their wife to listen to, if you're a working mom or stay at home, how how does it bring purpose being in a relationship with Christ? Okay. Um, Genesis 128 is, uh, has become Isaiah six, eight is one of my favorite uh, verses in the Bible, um, which is here I am send me. Um, But I also, man, whoo, <sighs> didn't see the emotion coming uh anyway so uh but i i i what the my favorite verse uh that i that i think sums up everything um that i try to live my life about is and it, it'll probably surprise people is it's genesis 128 uh, Genesis 128, I wrote it down because I'm very terrible at memorizing things, but uh, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Um, the key parts of that passage are be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue, take dominion. So when we have to put this in context really quickly. God, this is in Genesis one, right? So we're, we're just, everything's just created. Uh, God's trying to tell us a story about man, uh, a creation and then his crowning achievement, which is man. And, and, and what God wanted from the beginning is all he wanted was a family. He wanted sons and daughters. That's it. And he said, Hey, here's the creation. Here it is. This is my masterpiece. And you're the crowning achievement. And you're in this garden with me. And what I want you to do is I want you to go from this garden. I'm going with you, but we're going to go from this garden. I want you to be my representative outside of this garden. I want you to go out there and I want you to be fruitful, do good things, make make the world better, Uh, multiply, get get me more sons and daughters. Uh, And then subdue take dominion subdue and take dominion yes what does that mean that means the culture that we see in heaven then needs to be there out there in the world and so genesis 128 is such an important thing everybody asks everybody every man's asking what's my purpose that's your purpose man your purpose then is to help uh uh Take the atmosphere of heaven and, and, take the, and, and take the character of Jesus out in the world to do what? Which is to change the culture to make it more like it does uh, in, in, in heaven when we're, when we're connected with, with, with God. And that's the idea. So that, that Bible verse is called the cultural mandate. It's a cultural mandate. Well, I think it's a bookend. It's in Genesis, and of course, we're going all the way to the Old Testament or the New Testament now. And Revelation is obviously the bookend, but Revelation talks about the new heaven and new earth. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and, I, and we can get in. I don't want to get into eschatology and the end times and all this kind of stuff, but I, I will say that I think we're home already. We're home. This is home. Now we have work to do. We have work to do. What is your purpose? Genesis one twenty eight, and then Matthew was it twenty six. The Great Commission, they're the same thing. It's to, it's to go out and change the culture. How do you do that? We talked about agape love. Uh, approach it with agape love. Approach everything with agape love. Mm. My goal is to pull the highest potential out of every other human being that I can 
and to pull the highest potential out of all of creation. Now, suddenly, if I'm an engineer, oh, now I get it. That's my purpose. But your mission has changed from a strength coach because now your mission is an engineer. Your mission as a strength coach are two different missions, same purpose. Now I can go home and, and leave from being a strength coach or an engineer for the day, and I can go home and I can still take the same purpose into my family. It's just a different mission. That's what I'm getting at. And so, so anyway, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> all good. No, all good. You're talking about cultural mandate and, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and how we find our identity in Christ and not what we do. And, yes. and so no, you, you yeah. absolutely knocked it out of the park. So here's, here's a quote from the book. I want everyone to hear this one. This is something that really stuck with me. I talked about how Eve made the mistake when she was thinking that she needed to become more like God by eating the fruit. When really, she didn't, in that moment of temptation, she forgot that she was already made in his image. Ah, yeah. And I, I love that. And, um, you know, we all make mistakes, right? It, it's, it's in all different areas of life. We have people listening to this podcast who, are, who do all different things, mostly strength and conditioning, but all different areas. You know, for, as a strength coach for you, I'd just be curious um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what's like a mistake maybe you've made um, that you've learned a lot from it? And I see you already shaking your head and trying to run yeah, through some stuff. Is this a five hour long podcast? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've made lots of mistakes, but again, um, I have to say that, uh, again, um, what we do with our mistakes is what matters, right? And so if you change and you use it to transform uh, how you do things. And I think that's the key. Um, the biggest mistake, I think, I mean, I thought when I was thinking about this, what is the biggest mistake I've made? And I think, honestly, we've kind of already talked about it. So I think it missing uh, that strength and conditioning was, was not my identity. It wasn't, mm. it didn't give me worth. It didn't do any of those things. What it was, it was a gift. It was a tool, the ability for me to be able to coach and communicate and, and inspire others to believe that they can do more than what they think they can. Uh, that's a that's a tool. That's a tool that allows me again to tie back to my purpose. And I'm using that particular tool right now in this mission of being a strength conditioning coach, right? And so um, I think that's the biggest. That's probably if somebody would have told me that um, right out of the gate before you know in grad school or not even grad school undergrad said hey this is what this is for you're learning a tool you, you know you're learning how to get good at this craft to use it as a tool uh i think that would have been awesome because it took me a while to figure that one out <laughs> um yeah. so so on that note what is the best piece of advice you've ever received uh i there's a buddy of mine here in town uh he's an, he's a uh, uh retired um he was a doctor uh, uh, in the Air Force, and then he then he took on a private practice here in town, and he just retired here like two three years ago, and uh, he's one of my mentors. And so, and by the way, if you don't have a mentor, get one, uh, and and make him and then make sure he's an old guy. Uh, and so I, I I sit down with this guy every once in a while, and I was I was kind of complaining. I'm like, man, you know, I've tried so hard. I was I was. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? I was kind of like frustrated because I've, I've been trying so hard to, to um, help people and, and, and to show them, hey, there's a better way of doing this. And, and uh, they just weren't getting it. And uh, he said this to me. He said, Mike, Jesus never told you to save his lambs. He only told you to feed them. The saving is up to him and to the Holy Spirit. And, and that person has some responsibility in that as well. And so, so all we can do is, is take the talents we have, improve on those talents, get better at them. Every day is training day. Every day is training day. And then, and then what we do is we just take that stuff and feed the people uh, that we're working with as best we can and let God take it from there. That's the only thing we can do. Mike, I can keep going for hours just picking your brain. You're just such a wealth of knowledge. And if you guys want to hear more from Mike and his thoughts, I mean, check out the book, Seek, Adapt, Endure, Following the Way of the World's Most Authentic Man. Um, where where can everybody find the book, Mike? Uh, so it's on Amazon. Uh, it's on Barnes & Noble website and Books A Million as well. And then Christian Faith Publishing 
uh, is it's on their website as well. And they're, they're the ones that published the book. And awesome. by the way, th thank you to them because uh, they took a huge chance on a guy that's never done this before. <laughs> well, you did a great job. Um, well, we end all these episodes with the same three questions, Mike. I want to throw them to you as well. We call them our fast finishers. Um, first question for you is what's your favorite book that you've read? Okay. So I know this is going to sound really uh, uh, like I'm making this up, but it's not. Um, I, I thought long and hard about this because books are probably one of the most, my favorite things in the world. So I was like, what is the one book I like the most? Um, and I don't know what it, I, I don't know that I can do that, but so, it, but that's not the reason why I picked this one. It's the Bible. And, and the reason why is because you can become an expert in that Bible. You can, you know, open it up and learn more and learn more and learn more. And the more you learn, the more you want to know more about what's in there and yes. you can spend a lifetime and you're never, ever going to understand the whole thing. And I love that because that is done on purpose. God did that on purpose because he wants us to con continue to pursue um, and, and to try to try to, to, to learn more. And we're just never, ever going to have be an expert about it. What's your favorite verse or story from the Bible? So again, I think Genesis 128 is my favorite. I also like Isaiah 6, 8. Uh, here I am, send me. And then probably, ah, oh, man, there's so many stories. <laughs> I really like the, I, I like the story of Elijah. Um, I just love reading what Jesus has to say in, in, in every, I don't know. I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> I, just can't, I can't come up with one. Um, but I think, I think, so. I'll, let's, let's do this. My three of my favorite characters, uh, are, are Elijah. That dude's just a flat out wild man, hardcore dude. Uh, really loved him. I uh, love Jesus, of course. And then I really like Paul as well. And I, what I really love about Paul is I also, I do like philosophy as well. Um, and I love the story of Paul going to, uh, Greece and standing was it was it a call what would they call it the a, in the a, uh oh man it's the uh is it start with an a, a? uh uh Acropolis Acropolis it, it it might be something like that yeah Somebody listening probably knows it better than us but but that, that when he goes there any 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 uh because what this was was all all the philosophers would get together and they just sit there and talk and try to understand life and and, and and get into these discussions about the deeper things of life Paul shows up and says hey you guys are on the right track, but you're missing it. Let me introduce you to this guy by the name of Jesus. I just love that. I, if there's, if there, actually, you know what? That might be my favorite one. Because <laughs> I could go in back in time and just show up and be a fly in the wall. That would be cool. Would, I would go there. That's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, I agree. That would be great. Um, here's the last one. How do you define success? Uh, I define success through consistent effort just getting up and doing it again. And, and, uh, I've noticed that, that when I am not happy with myself, it's because I didn't give my consistent, my best consistent effort. So if I go home at the end of the day and something's eating away at me, hardly ever is it coming from a failure of some sort. It's almost always because I didn't try hard enough or give my effort uh, where, I, where it could have been. And that's so consistent effort. Thank you again, Mike, for coming on the show. If anybody wants to reach out to you and, and talk to you a little bit more on this stuff, how, how can they get in touch with you? Best way is uh, my email, which is Mike Sanders, HP for human performance uh, at gmail.com. So I'll say it again, Mike Sanders, HP at gmail.com. And then we also have a website that I'm not super proud of, but um, <laughs> we're still trying to make it better. Uh, and uh, I'll give that to you too. So I have a men's ministry um, that we run on the side. And by the way, if you guys are, if anybody's interested in running a men's ministry, uh, that, that uses the book, we were actually coming up with tools that you can do. It's actually pretty easy, uh, on, on how to do it. And, um, and anyway, so that's tied to a ministry that I, that we call Junto tribe, which is J U N T O tribe, T R I B E. So Junto tribe.com. And you can go to the website and, uh, that's, that's our website. Perfect. Um, yeah, I recommend you guys check it out. I, I've pulled stuff from there. And so that's that's great, Mike. Um, so so we always like to end these shows with some prayer. Uh, we love to invite our audience to join in and praying for you. And we spoke a little bit before the show. Is is it um, we want to pray for the ministry, the work you're doing in HP? 
Anything else you want to throw in there? Uh, yeah. Um, pray that I would be the best dad uh, and the bre- best husband that I can be, uh, and also the best friend. Amen. Love it. Let's do it. All right. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, God, for Mike and his willingness to come on this show and and speak to us and share what you've been pouring into him, God. Lord, he's just taught me personally so much, Lord, and all our listeners are are getting better from this. And and so we just pray that you would just bring it back to him tenfold, Lord God, that he would just, um, just be blessed from this, Lord, that you would continue to pour into him and help him to continue to create all these amazing resources for us, God. And um, we just thank you so much for... Um, just his opportunities that he has in, in his work, Lord God, um, within human performance, Lord, I pray that you'd bless him in that, that he would be an incredible leader that just shines a light for Jesus, Lord God. Help him to connect with people like never before, Lord God. Help him to go deeper, Lord God, and in relationship. And I just pray that uh, people would continue to be changed by his leadership. And we pray for him and his ministry with the men with Junto Tribe, Lord. Um, I pray that you would continue to use him to sharpen these men, Lord God, you'd sharpen him continuously and so that he can go and sharpen others. I pray, Lord God, for him as a husband and a father, Lord God, as a friend, that you would just help him to continue to make impact in those areas as well. And you just put a fire in his heart, Lord God, to, to make a difference in this world. And I pray that every day, Lord God, he would just truly see how you are with him through it all and that he'd be reminded of that and just the opportunity you give him through Christ to, to, to accomplish his dreams in that area. And so... Lord, I just pray that you'd bless him. We thank you so, so much for him, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.